Yeah, let me start. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to APCP String Seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Joyi Chakravati uh, from ICTS India. He is a PhD student uh, in the ICTS and he will graduate in the beginning of the next year. Today, he will talk about toy models for monogamy and the bets of the gold, uh, gold pa paradoxes. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Joyi. Thank you, Jungi, for the kind introduction. So I would have liked to be there in person, but as the circumstances are right now, yeah, it is not possible. But yeah, thanks for inviting me to this talk. So today I'm going to talk about the star models for monogamy and bags of gold paradoxes. And this is based on two papers, one paper with Tunir and Priyadashi, who are graduate students here at ICTS. And another way which I wrote. Uh, so, uh, so this is based on these two papers. The underlying theme of this talk is to pose these paradoxes using bulk effective field theory and to precisely understand what goes wrong while using such a description. So the rough outline is I'll introduce uh, the uh, uh, what is the monogamy paradox and then I'll formulate what tools we use to look at this paradox, to investigate this paradox. And then I'll propose the resolution for this. Our, 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 uh, the resolution which we think is uh, 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 should hold for this case. And then similarly with the black bags of gold paradox, I'll first introduce it. Then, I'll, uh, then we'll look into this in detail. And finally, we'll uh, see what is the resolution here. So let me start with a toy model for monogamy paradox. So here our goal is to investigate a toy model in flag space, which captures essential features of the monogamy paradox for old flag space black holes within a clean calculational framework. And this builds upon previous work by Samir Mathur and also these firewall paradoxes, uh, firewall, firewall paradox paper by AMPSS. Now, in general, there exists no nice prescription to uh, define or compute entanglement measures like von Neumann entropy from the bulk gravity viewpoint. There are many nice uh, fine grained formulas from the CFT viewpoint where we can specify some region on the CFT and then we can calculate the uh, entanglement. But from the bulk gravity viewpoint, it's a it's a bit difficult, it's a bit messy uh, to construct such notions of entanglement measures. So we formulate the measure in terms of monogamy of CHSS correlations, which are basically a, a repackaged version of Bell inequalities. And we use them to quantify the monogamy of entanglement. And this builds upon a paper by Suvrat uh, in which he looked at this paradox from the uh, in background 80s. Now, within effective field theory, we'll show that the entanglement of approximately local bulk modes just outside a region B with modes just outside a region A and with modes situated far apart, uh, far away at the past or future null infinity gives rise to an order one violation in monogamy of entanglement. So the physical picture to keep in mind is this. We consider, uh, uh, we cons uh, so our third model is in empty flat space. We are not looking at black holes because of certain regions, but we are trying to address the question, a question about monogamy paradox of black holes in terms of this empty flat space toy model. And these are our regions A, B, and C, where A region is in the, in the interior of an outgoing light shell, which is spherically symmetric. B region is outside the light cone, and C region is at the as, as very, at very close to the past of future null infinity. Note that all these three regions, all these three blue shaded regions are spherically, uh, are, have a spherical support. So essentially we are smearing uh, uh, the regions in, inside uh, this light cone and outside the light cone as well as at the far, far distant, uh, far distant region C. We'll argue that the resolution of the paradox is that our spatially separated observables probe the same underlying degrees of freedom. That is, such observables act on a non-factorized Hilbert space and thereby circumvent the conflict with monogamy of entanglement. So, in order to uh, so let us introduce our tool for looking at uh, this uh, this uh, situation. 
so this is known as the chhss observable and let me first briefly remind how the chhss observable works in quantum mechanics so consider two sets of operators a1 ais and bis which are defined such that the operator norm is less than equal to 1 that is no eigen value of this operator can be greater than 1 or less than minus 1 and we and the uh, these operators ai and bj commute with each other now given such a set of operators our chhss operator is defined as this particular combination now why is this operator essential it is essential because for classical observables the cab is, is bounded by 2 whereas in quantum mechanics this classical bound of 2 can be violated and this is what is the basic essence of bell inequalities that a bell inequality that in quantum mechanics there is a violation of bell inequalities so we can go beyond this 2 to and the maximum value is something like 2 okay now let us consider another set of operators which are the cs such that they commute with both a's and b's and we can again use this to construct another chhss operator cac as just as we defined in the previous case now the surprising statement is that the the uh, monogamy of entanglement is something like cab square plus cac square should always be less than equal to 8 so this is a very strong statement about about the about monogamy of entanglement that it can never violate that it can be never greater than 8 okay but what does this statement means this statement means that there cannot be a scenario where both systems ab and ac possess a non classical description that is if cab is greater than 2 then cac has to be necessarily less than 2 because uh, of this statement uh, can i uh, yeah, here yeah. when you say monogamy entanglement uh, yes. uh, what do you mean by that so yeah so uh, so consider you have uh, two cube okay let me uh, motivate it from uh, uh, the monogamy paradox itself so in monogamy paradox what happens is you have this two uh, you have a pair of hawking quanta which are created at the horizon one falls in one goes out both are maximally entangled but in order for the information uh, to be conserved let's say if you want uh, the final state to contain information about the initial state you require that the hawking quanta which goes out has has to be entangled with the other quanta but we know that such such as uh, such a situation cannot exist because if you have maximal entanglement between the first two hawking quanta then it can, then the outgoing one cannot be entangled with any other quanta it's a precise setup here as well let's say you have two three systems a b and c if a and b are maximally entangled with each other then neither the system a or neither the system b can be entangled with the system c so here when you say system a and b and c it's not the operator it's a, like a, some hilbert space or yes yes yeah so yes here we are assuming that the hilbert space we are working with a, a, a factorized hilbert space so mm -hmm. so if, if we have this so this a b c are regions and on that we are defining these operators a i's b i's and c i's respectively so let's say if the c a b region is maximally entangled then that means that this root bound will that this bound of 2 root 2 will be satisfied now if one of these guys if cab is 2 root 2 then the other guy which is cac has to be necessarily equal to 0 so that's the uh, that's the uh, 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 way in which this uh, particular statement cleverly encapsulates all these statements about monogamy that if systems a and b are maximally entangled it cannot be entangled with another system c because if c a b is root two root two then the other has to be necessarily zero so this this uh, chshh operator measure the uh, this entanglement yes 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 however using gravity we will show that there exists a violation of this statement of monogamy of entanglement which leads to the paradox so this eight the inequality of eight is not respected in a theory of gravity if we assume that the hilbert space is factorized so within a bulk effective field theory we usually assume that the hilbert space is factorized and that is what it went into the constructions of mathur and amps okay so we can construct up one very baby example of chhss correlations in quantum mechanics 
which violates this bound CAB greater than 2. So let us consider two commuting harmonic of, of oscillators A and B with corresponding annihilation of operators alpha A and alpha B. And let P of S denote the projector onto SF vacuum where S is A or B. So there is a way to write down this bell operators, which looks a bit complicated, but these operators resemble standard spin operators when expressed in the zero one basis. So they are uh, motivated you from this uh, polymetric construction, but uh, they look a bit complicated, but it's very fairly trivial once we write down in the zero one basis. And this operator satisfied the norm that AI is equal to BI is equal to one. So we can use them in this construction of CHMC's inequalities. And we will consider a generalized thermofield double state, which is given by this. Here, if we set X squared is equal to E to the power minus beta, we recover the usual thermofield double state. Now, if we calculate the expectation value of CAB, which is constructed using these operators, recall that CAB is this combination of operators, is, is basically this combination of operators. If we use these operators and calculate the CAB, we will get some expression, which is maximized, maximized as a, at x is equal to half, and it gives rise to 2.39, which is a non-classical correlation. Okay, so let us move on to field theory. How do we look at this uh, operator construction in field theory? So we will now develop the technology to calculate CHS correlator in field theory and show how the classical bound is violated there. Here the statement that the operators A, B and C commute are same as saying that these operators are mirrored over small intervals within space-like separated regions. So it's the same statement that space-like separated operators commute. However, such a spatial partitioning implies, okay, such a spatial partitioning implies that Hilbert space factorizes upon spatial partitioning in QFT. In the toy example, our thermofield double state was the entangled state. In general, the global vacuum of any field theory is highly entangled. In particular, the global state is a thermofield double when written using Rindler modes. So we will use, utilize this fact. We'll again try to construct these operators as we did in the quantum mechanical case, where in, where we have an additional input, that is we write down this P of S in a certain form. So the operator construction is precisely the same as we did in this quantum mechanical case. So let me define what are alpha and P here. So P of S is the projected onto the oscillator vacuum. It's a fairly trivial, okay, this is a tedious integral to work out, but it projects onto the vacuum end of the day. And using this P of S, we can construct the most general two point correlator. The point is one can uh, one, any desired two point function with respect to the global vacuum will be found by the values of Q, this function Q and its derivatives. As a demonstration, let's say if we want a particular two point function, we can just write out. So, so it, this is some combination of alphas and P's, right? And this is these alphas and P's are what enter into this A's. So we are writing down the most general two point function and taking the derivatives in order to extract out the two point correlator in order to extract the CHSS correlator. And here, first we have to write down this alphas in terms of the global modes because the vacuum on which we are uh, acting is really the global vacuum. So it's better to start, uh, decompose these alpha oscillators in terms of this vacuum, uh, vacuum modes. And then one can write down this function, this CHSS correlator in terms of the bubbling of coefficients hsm genus so we will now set up this problem in flat space gravity and extract out the bubbling of coefficients so the uh, so the uh, total story here is that if we want to calculate the css observable we need the bubbling of coefficients okay so we will uh, now use this technology developed in previous slides to evaluate the css correlator in flat space and we'll consider three space like regions where we will um, smear uh, operators and use them to calculate this particular correlators. Note that we will be working in the limit G Newton goes to zero and we'll keep track of small corrections of order square root G Newton. So in gravity, we will set this G Newton to zero and we will make it a completely bulk effective field theory calculation. Okay, so one can solve for the, the scalar field phi in terms of global modes. It's a simple, fairly simple solution. And this is the support of the, uh, the operators A's and B's. So we defined alpha as a as the following combination. Well, let me just explain what is this alpha A and alpha B. 
So consider a space like slicing where we choose the regions A and B. We choose a tuning function which is supported very close to u is equal to zero. Recall that u is equal to zero is the outgoing red line. So we want to choose some intervals which are very close to t is equal to zero, and we can choose them and multiply this scalar field phi with this t of u and do some Redinger smearing. So these are how we define alphas. Now we have a definition for alphas. We have a definition for the PAs, and we know how to relate alphas to the global modes. And this gives us the Bogolyubov coefficients in some limit. One can use them to calculate the CAP, which again comes to be this following expression, and it it gives us some 2.39. Note that it is the same expression as in quantum mechanics because we have really chosen the same form of operators in quantum field theory. So this is what we are really concerned with. That the CAB is some 2.39 for C for this A and B regions. Okay. So any questions here? So here you mentioned that is correction scalar to G. So yes. Yes. What do you mean by that? Uh, yes. 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 So so we consider a scalar field minimally coupled to gravity, and there were this G Newton factors all around. So what we have really done is not to calculate those G Newton factors, but we have said G Newton very small. So there are the small corrections to this 2.39. So this 2.39 is really some uh, 2.39 plus order of square root g newton plus some order of epsilon, where epsilon is uh, uh, so, uh, so, uh, some parameter which is introduced due to our smearing choices. So we had done some smearing right in the over some over some small region. So epsilon, there are small length scales associated with this smearing, and this whole 2.39 is 2.39 plus order g newton plus order of epsilon. So here you consider the free scalar field. Yes, coupled to uh, minimally coupled to gravity. However, this uh, order G Newton, uh, we have not really calculated that intra gravity interaction part, but we have kept it with order G Newton. But uh, what about the scalar? Like uh, you can can also also consider the interaction of the scalar field, like a FIFO or so on. Yes, here we have used the scalar field, which is minimally coupled free scalar field. Like our scalar field is really free. One can uh, uh, put some lambda phi to the power four also, but again we can work in a situation where this, uh, where we can uh, set lambda very close to zero. So this will really be some order of lambda, uh, like order g newton plus order of lambda, or lambda squared something. Yeah. Okay. So now we proceed to calculate CAC. This is the interesting part. So the key ingredients to calculate CAC are to construct some operators in this region C, and in order to construct these operators on region C, we'll take into account two important physical uh, aspects. The first important physical aspect is that the Hamiltonian of gravity is a boundary term and has support in region C, which uh, which is the region that includes the boundary. The second important aspect is that there is a Lie-Schlieder property of the vacuum. And the Lie-Schlieder property is the fact that one can create operators Q i with support in region C, which mimic the action of B i operators or A i operators on the vacuum stick. However, these operators Q i are unbounded operators, and recall that for the CHHS correlators, we would want that these operators should really be bounded. So they should have this less. Their eigenvalue should be less than equal to one or greater than equal to minus one. But these operators, q i, are really unbounded. So we are required to we are required to calculate some bounded operators c i from these q i's, which can be constructed using products of c i's with something which we call the boundary projectors, which I'll shortly define afterwards. And these boundary projectors are constituted from the boundary Hamilton. So there are two things. One the first thing is that the Hamiltonian of gravity is a boundary term. The second thing is that, that there is a Lie-Schlieder property using which we can calculate create operators q i. And the third thing, which is a combination of these two, is that we one can construct operators c i which live in the region C such that they are bounded. And in order to do that, we would require that the Hamilton uh, uh, the, uh, the boundary Hamiltonian as well as the Lie-Schlieder property. 
so let me go through this step by step so this c region is really close to the boundary region now if you work with the atm hamiltonian which is basically uh, which we know that is just a boundary integral and the global vacuum projector which i was uh, talking about just earlier the, the boundary projector is just the uh, exponential of this hamiltonian multiplied by number a where we take a goes to infinity so this projects onto the vacuum subspace if we take this a goes to infinity of this guy of this exponential of minus a h this will project onto the ground uh, vacuum subspace now the, in, in flat space there is an additional quantum number which is called this super translations so you recall that in ads we have a unique global vacuum but in flat space the vacuum is not really unique but it it is spanned by this space of super translations so this particular projector will project onto the space of all super translations and this was worked out by uh, this uh, this uh, uh, subrat and his collaborators in some in a paper in 20 we also introduce a, another projector which projects onto energies below some ir scale delta and this is more physically motivated because in flat space we really need a cut off to uh, overcome ir divergences so we are we are looking at some uh, delta cut off and we want to project onto states below that not just the ground state which which these guys did but below this space of states below delta which is given by this theta function and this is also a boundary term why is it this about why this is a boundary term is because one can write down this theta function as some e to the power in i h divided by something there is a integral form of representation and since the hamiltonian is a boundary term this particular integral form from the particular integral form it's clear that this p of delta is also a boundary term so there are these two projectors which we will need in our construction of ci okay so in in flat space gravity so since the new tensor contains a zero mode the vacuum must be specified not only by the annihilation of the positive frequency modes of the new tensor and the scalar field but should also be labeled by the eigen value under the super translation sector so this is what i was just talking uh, before that there is an additional quantum number in addition to this energy there is also the super translation and here uh, this projector p0 can be represented on the fox space as the uh, our completeness relation over all this super translation sector similarly one can do this for the other projector as well and we will use this now to, okay okay let me first explain what is the rich leader property so this rich leader property more precisely is this particular statement that one can find out this qi operators which may make the action of bi operators on the ground state up to order g yeah uh, can i ask for one question yes 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 So uh, previously you talk about the scalar fields in the flat space and so on. But yes. Here, are you consider just gravit graviton or you also yes, consider better yes. the flat space? Yes. Yes. So here we consider. Uh, okay. Previously, yes, you are right that we were looking at just this scalar field thing. But now we turn gravity on. So if we turn gravity on, we would need to construct the entire uh, fog space. so we, this fox space will will be constructed by exciting gravitons as well as scalar field uh, excitations so that is why this op projector really projects onto the entire uh, the, the the ground space of this entire interacting theory of gravitons and scalar field okay so when you say hamiltonian is on the boundary yes it is just for the gravi gravity or is it also it is for the entire system for the gravity plus this thing that is also on the bound define the boundary yes yes that is essentially a boundary term it it was shown in this work by reggie and titlebaum that if you let's say if you introduce some stress energy in the bulb also this hamiltonian uh, uh, in the canonical formalism is really a boundary term okay even if there is matter interacting in them that is one of the surprising statements that is unique to gravity that a hamiltonian is always a boundary term in gravity even in metal fields yes metal. even if you introduce yeah. some stress energy team you knew yes mm -hmm. okay so this was the work of reggie and titlebaum so mm -hmm. uh, it's some it's a 1974 kind of work yeah 
So that is the surprising statement uh, here, and which and it's a crucial ingredient in our construction, as we will, as I'll show later. Okay, so one can then use this QIs and the projector to construct CIs. Uh, it, it might not be necessary to look into these expressions in detail, but for, for our, our purposes, CIs acting on this state 0s will, sorry, CIs acting on this state 0s will give this BIs acting on this state 0s up to order G meter. So that's the crucial ingredient which goes into it. So we can systematically construct this operator CI such that their action on the uh, such that they are bounded and their action on the ground state gives us the action of bi on the ground state and using this we will arrive at the conclusion that cac is equal to cab plus order g neutral plus order epsilon now for the maximum violation at x is equal to 2 we knew that cab was some 2.39 now CAB is equal to CAC, so it's something like 11.4, which is greater than 8. So, so we have an order one violation in the monogamy of entanglement. And this is the precise statement of monogamy paradox in our time mode. Here, this there is none no quantum gravity effect. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure. It's just canonical gravity. So we have not included any holography here as of now. Uh, we have not talked about holography in the sense of ADS CFT or the bulk boundary kind of theories. But what we have done is really exploited canonical holography. By canonical holography, I, we have exploited the statement that the Hamiltonian of gravity is a boundary term. And that is sufficient to give rise to this paradox. Let me try to understand. So here, what is yes? What, what is, is the origin of violation of monogamy? So let me just repeat. Yes. This. Yeah, in this gravity, what is the role of gravity in this calculation? Oh, the role of gravity is precisely this. The role of gravity is that the Hamiltonian of gravity is always a boundary term. If you had a non-gravitating theory. One could not have written this operators CIs, which are constructed of these projectors. See, this operator CIs have these projectors inside, which are these P zeros and P deltas. There are these P zeros or P deltas. One can take either of these operators. However, if you did not have a theory of gravity, these P zeros and P deltas would not have been supported at the, just at the boundary, but it would have been supported on the entire space. The role of gravity is that these operators P0 and P delta are really supported on the boundary. So one can use this to write down that uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, operator CI is, which are supported in a region which contains the boundary. So this is the precise role of gravity here. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So, do you mean that the monogamy would not hold in general, or maybe there is some other like a loophole? What uh, is the in, conclusion of? Uh, uh, so, so let me. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, so if we had some other theory, which was a non-gravitating theory, one could not have written these operators, which are supported just at this re region C i. And then, as a consequence, one could not have made such a sharp statement about monogamy of entanglement, about the paradox in monogamy of entanglement. But since we are working in a theory which contains gravity, we are basically getting this particular statement. Since the, we can explicitly construct operators CI which live on the boundary. So it's a, this paradox is really uh, uh, a typical uh, okay it's a it's a paradox which could be posed only when you turn gravity on let's say we were working with this earlier scalar field theory we could not have posed that paradox because we could not have written this boundary projectors but once you turn gravity on the hamiltonian is a boundary term and one could use that to write down this paradox 
Well, you didn't even have a black hole here, right? It's just gravity. Precisely. Precisely. Black. Precisely. Precisely. So, so let me come back to that question. So the point is uh, that here we have modeled the monogamy paradox of black holes using an outgoing uh, light shell uh, in in the interior of empty flat space. Why we did not do it for black hole was this uh, following thing: we do not know the projectors, the boundary projectors onto the black hole states. We, we do not know the projectors p zero and p delta on the, uh, on onto the space of black hole states. So that is why we chose to look at this on in empty flat space background because we know that the vacuum is really the empty flat space. But our point is that the essential features of the monogamy paradox of black holes is encapsulated in our toy model as well. Since we are really looking out, uh, since we are really looking out, uh, looking at modes which are supported on these intervals a, b, and c, which is typical of black holes as well. So it's a toy model in that sense. Uh, why did not you use J, uh, JT gravity? It's like you use two dimensional gravity, right? Precisely. I choose JT. There, yeah, yeah, just, uh, yeah. So there also uh, the following situation would happen that it's very difficult to write down this projector onto black hole states. We will, I mean, if we can, even in JT gravity, we can again project onto the vacuum state. But we do not know what is the exact projector onto the space of black hole microstates. I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's why we, we are doing a toy model here. Because we do not know what are the space of black hole microstates. So we do not know what is the projector onto them. So one can try to do a, a try to make a comparative toy model which captures these features a, a, of the monogamy of a time. Okay, so this is the paradox, and our the, our proposed resolution to the paradox is that our spatially separated observables probe the same underlying degrees of freedom. So one of the assumptions which went into our paradox was that our all these all these systems A, B, and C have uh, 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 the operators defined on the AIs, BIs, and CIs. Uh, are space-like separated and hence they commute. But in the theory of gravity, they don't exactly commute. So that's our resolution. That uh, uh, this uh, observables really act on a non-factorized Hilbert space. It's not a factorized Hilbert space, and this circumvents the conflict with monogamy of entanglement. So the factorization of Hilbert space on spatial partitioning ground, which is an implicit assumption, is simply incorrect. And this is because there are no local local gauge invariant operators in gravity. So if you take the commutator of two operators, let's say if you dress, dress these operators, AIs and BIs properly, and take the commutators between them, they would be zero. Even, even though in bulk effective field theory, our, our intuition will tell that this, since these op operators are space-like separated, their commutator will be zero. But secretly, they are not, since there are no local gauge invariant operators in gravity. And this is supported by the fact that one can compute these BIs and CJs explicitly and show that this is not equal to zero, even though our intuition suggests otherwise. So there is no real conflict here. This statement is, is, is this is this 11.4 uh, uh, thing which we obtained at was really a, in a certain sense a bad calculation because we we are not working with the factorized Hilbert space, which was an assumption which went in. So, so let's go let the can uh can we we still we cannot consider the factorized the Hilbert space or it's uh, funny to say it's the Hilbert space in the classical level, but uh, yeah, so uh, classically one should understand this as the observables AIs, BIs, and CIs, and even they don't commute. That's the point which I want to convey here. So if if you prop, if you try to, so the point is in, in the Gauss law in gravity knows about what is in the interior. Uh -huh. From the boundary, you can know what is in the interior. So the point is, since the boundary theory knows about the interior, one cannot really write down boundary operators which are commuting with the interior operators. So that's the kind of thing which one should have looked at while uh, asking these monogamy paradoxes in the first place. Uh, so yeah. So another way to understand this is as follows. 
so this is uh, uh, really it, uh, uh, so this is this is one of the programs which sugar has been advocating for some time that the degrees of freedom in region c already contains information about the a and b regions which is known as the principle of holography of information and this is addressed very nicely in this review by sugar okay so i'll conclude this part and move on to the second part of my talk which is a model of the bags of gold paradox so are there any questions here okay so i'll be a bit conceptual in this uh, bags of gold paradox and won't show exact calculations but uh, yeah, but uh, yeah you would can look at this particular paper where we have constructed everything in detail so let me first state what the paradox is certain space like slices for example there are this hartman maldasena surfaces which go inside the black hole interior become very large in volume at late boundary times and these surfaces are uh, one can find all uh, these surfaces in the study of volume complexity and other uh, uh, places where one extremize this volume of slices which go inside the interior so these slices really become very large in volume at boundary time at late boundary times and these slices can host a considerable number of semi classical excitations which is far higher than what the bekenstein hawking entropy suggests and this leads to the bags of gold paradox now i'll briefly uh, say what is our uh, uh, proposed resolution and we will go into all these things in detail one after another so our proposed resolution is that semi classical bulk states which are placed far apart from each other in the interior are seemingly orthogonal however these states have small but significant inner products between them and which deviates from the semi classical expectation of zero inner products and this is what leads to the overcounting of the entropy so let me go through this one uh, step by step first so these are the slices which i am talking about since blue lines represent this um, uh, large volume slices on which we uh, we put this gaussian like excitations this gaussian like bumps are excitations which are separated far apart on this large volume slices and one can uh, go to later and later times where this volume increases uh, with time and as a consequence one can put in a large number of these excitations so if we nicely count the entropy of this large number of excitations it's far higher it one can uh, one can find it that it is far higher than the bekenstein hawking entropy and that is the paradox so uh, we are interested in the maximum volume of slices which end at u not comma 0 on the left horizon and 0 comma u not on the right horizon in this figure consider that this uh, point of intersection of this slice with the uh, horizon is u not comma 0 on the left and 0 comma u not on the right so then the expression for the volume of this slice is given by something which is proportional to log of u not where uh, other terms uh, 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 where beta is the inverse temperature and k and order 1 are other terms of order 1 now one can use the uh, one can construct up of uh, excitations using in the interior by acting with unitary operators on the right cft and these excitations are of this following form that you you have some u1 of p and then you deform it with this e to the power plus minus i beta h by 2 so this really what it does it uh, constructs some interior excitations so we have a description for looking at these interior excitations as well as we know how the volume grows okay so one can then so we, let's construct one excitation like this and then one can construct another excitation like this so so the let me briefly ex explain what this ex other excitation is so this unitary operator u1 so the unitary operator u1 which is here it really controls the positions of the excitations on the slice due to the time like coordinate p in the exterior becoming a space like coordinate in the interior let me briefly explain what this is so uh, let's say we have another excitation which is of this form the uh, the action of the rindler hamiltonian using factors of e to the power plus minus i h r t spatially separates this second excitation from the first one and this is this is because the the exterior time like coordinate becomes space like in the interior so if we uh, introduce a, a second excitation at a much later time after this first excitation 
what what it will really do is basically it will propagate uh, into this bulk and this will separates a, a space like so the time like separation on the boundary becomes space like separation on the interior so one can keep putting multiple excitations like this so that's the rough idea how we are introducing excitations on the on this slice okay so we can once we have this multiple excitations we can work within uh, effective field theory and we generate excitations with small back reaction for m number of excitations with energies of order e not this leads to some m into e e not should be less less than the mass of the black hole and we will ensure that the density of excitations which is the number of excitations m divided by volume v is finite in the thermodynamic limit which is with m and v large and this will allow us to calculate the entropy of this effective field theory excitations by treating the system as a dilute gas of excitations living on the slice so one can use the micro canonical ensemble to calculate the entropy now and it's no surprise that the entropy grows proportional to volume because we are really constitute uh, constructing a dilute gas of excitations and we know, know that the volume of this slice is something like log of u not from here we know that the volume of slice is log of u not and the entropy grows proportional to volume so the entropy really grows proportional to log of u not so as we increase u not here one can keep putting in a large number of excitations and surpass the bekenstein hawking entropy so this is the example paradox now let me come to our resolution so the resolution Uh, uh, is that there exists small inner products between these states between these excitations which we have introduced, and the paradox arises due to a huge overcounting of the bulk Hilbert space. Now, to motivate this, in semi-classical gravity, the inner product between two bulk states is given by let's say we have two bulk states which is G zero and G classical, a G C L which is, is some some number some exponential of some number. Here n is basically one by g newton, so n is the n square of the CL, and this v is an order one quantity, which is really the phase space distance between this, these two metrics. So if we represent these two metrics as some uh, uh, as some uh, uh, corresponding classical configurations of the phase space, v is really the distance between these two phase space configurations. so this inner product can be used by a, 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 it can be computed by using coherent states however this description is very misleading when the phase space distance between corresponding classical configurations is very large so this is a very approximate formula which holds in uh, only when the phase space distance is not very large this formula is true if we had a theory of electrodynamics or any other theory it would have been very nice but gravity has this subtle difference where if you have the phase space distance between between this these two metrics to be very large this formula breaks down and when the distance is very large we expect that the inner product between it goes to zero however the inner products do not actually go to zero but develop a saturated fat tail of order e to the power minus n so this was encountered in the work of kiryakos and sobrat and this is the motivation for our overcounting of interior excitations and consequently it explains why the excitations are not really independent so any questions about this so your conclusion maybe next slide you will yes yes my conclusion will be uh, the entropy will not uh, be go beyond the the bekenstein hawking entropy. precisely 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 okay. and from the bulk perspective this is the precise reason why it does not uh, uh, go beyond the bekenstein hawking entropy because this uh, what we are thinking of as as independent excitations are not really independent excitations they still have this small inner products of order e to the power minus okay. our semi classical intuition would have told us that if we separate these excitations far apart from each other their inner products would have decayed to zero because this exponential of minus v will be very large or oh, will be very small exponential of minus v will be very very small however they don't really go to uh, zero but they saturate at some order e to the power minus n so that's the uh, resolution which we think 
Now, one can think of a problem that how many bulk excitations can we fit inside a smaller Hilbert space? So the problem is precisely this: that consider a Hilbert space of dimension n. What is the maximum number m of vectors v i which satisfy the following relations? That is the inner product. That is the that is the uh, that is the state is normalized, and the inner product between two different states should be less than or equal to order epsilon. So we will derive a right now. We will derive a very nice rough estimate of this. And the way to do this is to uh, consider that this unit vectors in the Hilbert space live on the surface of a two n minus one dimensional real sphere, and we divide this two n minus one dimensional real sphere with the area of what we call the exclusion zone. Here, the exclusion zone is basically a zone in which is surrounding this vector v i, where if we introduce another vector v i, this inner product will be violated. so let's say if we have some vi if we have some vector vi we cannot insert another vector vector vj which is very close to it otherwise this inner product between vi and vj will be greater than epsilon so this defines an exclusion zone so we have this a2 n minus 1 dimensional real sphere and we divide this by this exclusion zone and this gives us a rough estimate for the maximum number of vectors which one can embed in this hilbert space And this number is actually very large. It's some n into e to the power n epsilon square by two. So to give an idea of how large this number is, let's say if we have some n is equal to e to the power s, which is some ten to the power five, then the maximum number of vectors which can be accommodated with so with e to with this amount of small corrections is far more sizable than any known number in our universe kind of thing. this is a very large way uh, like this is uh, uh, this encodes a very large number of vectors with small inner products it's very surprising that even with small inner products one could embed such a large number of uh, uh, vectors and this is how we really think that the bulk excitations are uh, described in this bags of gold scenario one can embed a large number of bulk excitations with very small inner products and still they will constitute a very small hilbert space Which is which? Whose dimension it is given by the Bekele-Stein-Hawking entropy? We had a few checks for the, our proposal. So we showed that there is no paradox in the CFT using this mentioned form of interior excitations, and we posed the paradox for single-sided pure-state black holes, and where we demonstrated that there are small inner products between candidate excitations of this order, the same order. and another feature or another thing which we investigated in our work is that such excitations lead to qualitative and quantitative differences in spectral observables like level spacing distribution and the spectral form factor so there are associated paradoxes in the spectral form factor and the level spacing distribution if one considers this kind form of excitations like if let's say if we, there are a large number of bulk excitations even the spectral form factor calculation will differ but our resolution fixes it in so and we also looked at it in the context of toy small and matrix models where we demonstrated how candidate interior excitations can lead to a overcounted hilbert space so let me come to the conclusion of my talk so here we have looked into two paradoxes from the bulk perspective one is the bags of gold paradox which could be resolved using small gravitational corrections while the monogamy paradox requires order one corrections and this order one corrections really come because we did not take into account the commutator structure properly both paradoxes demonstrate the failure of effective field theory and requires us to go beyond it the case of blacks of gold paradox requires quantum gravity corrections that is the fat tail of inner products for its resolution while in contrast the monogamy paradox arises due to the assumption that the hilbert space does not factorize upon spatial partition so one has to take this factor into account in order to not lead to this monogamy paradox so thank you all for listening and if there are questions yeah one more yeah uh please ask any question uh i have can you comment on the this metric model story yeah so essentially uh, uh, okay so in small and 
matrix models there is really no notion of holography because holography emerges at large so but this was really toy models where we constructed up these kind of excitations these kind of excitations where we systematically generated these excitations using a computer program and showed that there can be a huge number of film, uh, vectors which can be written like this with small inner products so that was essentially the goal of this uh, matrix model story so we wanted some working example where we could show that this actually exists that these uh, excitations are really of order e to the power minus n and one can have a large number of these excitations so the the, the reason why you talk about small n is because uh, you use the numerical calculation precisely 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 i see so we were, yeah we wanted to see whether uh, uh, this kind of relation holds there or not it really holds one can have a very large number of factors yes but the, how do you know that it, why it relates to the in, the in, excitation of the inside of the horizon or something uh okay so uh, uh, why these uh, excitations really are in, in the inside of the horizon for the matrix case yeah, yeah so in matrix case there is really no bulk dual i agree there is really no bulk dual i agree with that but what kind of feature do, does it this kind of excitation show so so that you you can maybe you have some like a reason why it is analogy of the inside the excitation yes 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 so the reason is uh, it serves to motivate our uh, uh, this particular picture from the boundary side so so if we constructed a thermophile double kind of boundary state and then we deformed it using some operators like this so it really motivates this uh, picture from the boundary side that this excitation that one can have a large number of vectors which uh, which may correspond in the large n limit to the interior of course we cannot do large n dynamics on a computer because we really have to take n goes to infinity so we don't really have any notion of bulk in our matrix model small and matrix model computations but it serves to motivate from the boundary side that at least one can write down these vectors in the they have some uh, 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 they follow this particular rule that uh, one can construct a large number of excitations with small inner product so this is one thing which we wanted to test which we tested and as well as uh, yeah as well as uh, okay yeah this is really the kind of thing which we wanted to test Yeah. But you are right that uh, you won't get we won't get any bulk do in uh, while working on a computer at least. So, so there is really no notion of an interior or horizon or anything from in a small and toy matrix model. But it serves to motivate. Yes. So maybe. Maybe it's a difficult, but uh, like a BFSS model or yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I did not uh, construct. Uh, I did not uh, work with the BFSS matrix model in this particular case, but with very simple toy matrix models, the kind of thing which this Kotler et al. did in their kind of work on this spectral form factor and stuff. I was working with those kind of matrix models. Also, here already, uh, Madis also mentioned that, but uh, here. Can you also, like uh, recently, there are a lot of development in the JT gravity coupled to CFT and so on. Yes, it does. Uh, point out there's some problem in the this coupling. Yes, yes. In the, but uh, the yes. anyway, so there are like uh, some like uh, your method can give more like a clear picture in precisely. In so yeah, let yeah yeah yeah. So let me make a brief comment on that. So. Uh, in this recent island kind of developments, you are uh, saying about this island kind of development. Mm -hmm. So, one of the problems which okay, uh, so this is really in our in a sense our work on the bags of old is really complementary to that. Uh, it is in a complementary direction to that. That is why, because of the fact that uh, even though you can use this quantum extremal surfaces to rule out the bags of old problem there. 
so uh, i think wall uh, adam wall gave a talk at peri uh, at this pitp school where he showed how this uh, a quantum maximal surfaces can rule out bags of cold air however there is no clear understanding of what is the picture from the bulk perspective so uh, let's say if somebody tells you that i can generate these excitations there was no clear understanding of what is the story from the bulk perspective that why this uh, why from the bulk perspective you are still overcounting the entropy of course the quantum maximal surfaces gave you a formula which is like the area by four g tutor but what is the story from the bulk perspective and that is the precise question which we wanted to address in our work that the story from the bulk perspective is that if you generate excitations like that in the interior they are not really uh, orthogonal so that is the kind of picture which we are pro providing and in a certain sense it's a complementary to the, the picture which they have because their picture really cal okay they have a very nice fine grained formula which calculates everything but uh, in a certain sense that formula misses out on some key physical pictures for example what happens what really happens from the bulk side i mean why are the if if one asks that why are the why is the entropy area by 4g newton the answer there is okay because the extrusion surface calculated it but what what is the physical picture which leads to this uh, we are addressing that question in the in this bags of gold part of work excuse me yeah uh, isn't it similar to for the bulk perspective to island formulation so you just need to add the area of this island in addition to this area over 4g and then this bath actually like gather some of these degrees of freedom so precisely 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 it's the same thing yeah it, it, this was i think proposed by alan well in his pitp talk yeah you are right it, it, this is precisely same thing so yeah that formula actually uh, okay it tells you that uh, these uh, that the entropy should be equal to area by 4g newton in spite of the fact that there are excitations in the in the interior but uh, the problem is one can again ask them okay this, this quantum external surfaces formula is calculating everything nice and clear but what is really happening to the excitations in the interior and that is the point which we were trying to address okay, thanks yeah. thank you Okay, uh, any other question? Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker for a nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.